exercise 7 you'll be doing differential and special stains. Differential stains exploit differences in physical characteristics among microorganisms. They employ combinations of stains to highlight these differences. The Gram stain is going to highlight differences in the cell walls of bacteria. The Zeal Nielsen acid fast stain also will highlight differences in cell walls. The Schaefer Fulton endospore stain is going to show the presence or absence of endospores formed by certain bacteria. And the Lifeson flagella stain will show the presence and arrangement of flagella if the microorganism has flagella. Remember, flagella in prokaryotes are too thin to be seen with a light microscope, so they must be stained in order to observe them. The Gram stain, probably the most important stain that we do in microbiology, is making use of two different basic dyes. The organism must be able to accept a basic dye in order to be stained in the Gram stain. And very often you'll see that an organism may have a Gram-negative cell wall, but there is some characteristic about it that does not allow it to accept a basic dye. And a very good example of that is Treponema pallidum, the organism that causes syphilis. This organism does have a gram-negative cell wall, but it has hydrophobic molecules in its cell, cell wall as well that pro prohibits the gram stain reagents or the dyes from sticking to it. The gram stain is based on differences in the cell wall composition. So here in A, you see a gram-positive cell wall depicted. These purple tubes that you see represent peptidoglycan. So gram-positive organisms have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan surrounding the plasma membrane. Contrast that with a gram-negative organism that has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, and surrounding that peptidoglycan, there is an outer membrane. This outer membrane is going to greatly influence how the two dyes used in the gram stain are going to stain the organism. There are two outcomes in the gram stain. The gram-positive organism, because of the thick layer of peptidoglycan, is going to retain the purple color. And the gram-negative organism, because it has that outer membrane and very little peptidoglycan, is going to lose the purple color during the rinse and is going to retain the red counterstain color. The gram stain procedure involves four di distinct steps. The first step, after preparing the smear and heat fixing the smear, we apply crystal violet. Crystal violet is the primary dye. It's a basic dye. And so any organism that can accept a basic dye is going to stain purple at this step. If we stopped right here, we actually would have a simple stain. But instead, we rinse and carry on with the application of the iodine. Iodine is the mordant. It's sort of like mortar or cement. It helps to cement that crystal violet in the peptidoglycan. Following a rinse with water, we then use the alcohol wash. This decolorization step is very important. It must be done briefly because if you overdo it, it can completely affect the outcome of the gram stain. The alcohol wash is going to remove the crystal violet if it's not very tightly bound. Now, an organism that has a thin layer of peptidoglycan, a gram-negative organism, is not going to be able to retain this crystal violet. The alcohol will wash it away very quickly. So the organism at this point that is gram-negative is going to be colorless, so we will have to apply a counterstain. The counterstain is called safranin. It's also a basic dye and it is a reddish color. When we finish the stain, then we will have gram-positive organisms staining purple, gram-negative organisms staining red. Now the gram stain is not an all-or-nothing per per perfect procedure. Things can go wrong. Errors that will cause a gram-positive organism to appear gram-negative or gram-variable, meaning that when you look at the slide you see both gram-positive areas and gram-negative areas, or using old Gram's iodine. Old Gram's iodine will not be able to complex with the crystal violet and will easily wash away, making the cells appear gram-negative when indeed they are gram-positive. An old culture has weak peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan must bind 
to the crystal violet and also to the mordant, the iodine. And if the peptidoglycan is too weak and cannot hold on to it, it will be rinsed away and it will pick up the counter stain, making it appear gram negative. Using too much alcohol. If you squirt and squirt and squirt with the alcohol, you are going to rinse away any of the complex crystal violet and iodine, even if it is in a thick cell wall. Water will do the same thing. If you excessively rinse with water, a gram-positive organism will appear gram-negative. There are also errors that will cause a gram-negative organism to appear gram-positive or gram-variable. For example, if you don't use enough alcohol. So if you are afraid you're going to over decolorize and do just a little squirt, then you are going to uh, inefficiently decolorize the gram negative organism and it will retain some crystal violet. It's the same thing with water, inadequate rinsing. Bacterial crowding. This is probably the most common things that uh, students will do putting too much of the organism on the slide. And when they are very close together, they are going to resist decolorization. There will be so many close together that that brief rinse with alcohol will not rinse away all of the crystal violet, leaving some of it behind and making the, spe the smear appear gram variable. And finally, using crystallized oh, old crystal violet. Old crystal violet will leave crystals behind, and the minute that uh, the crystals are there, they'll just continue to leach that purple color. Anything that's around is going to pick it up. The same with crystal violet running off your clothespin. So you want to be careful at the end of the procedure that you don't have any dyes running off your clothespin because the organisms will pick up any basic dye that's in the environment. There is great value at times in doing a direct smear. A direct smear simply is a specimen that comes to the lab, perhaps it's from a wound or perhaps it's from uh, a sputum culture, and the physician will ask that we immediately do a gram stain on it and look at the gram stain to get some idea if there is an infectious microorganism found within that specimen. At times it's useful to order a direct smear. If the specimen is from a sterile body site, for example, if we find bacteria in a gram stain, it can signal an infection. A gram stain can be done very quickly, so we can get information back to the clinician very quickly. For example, a spinal fluid is always gram stained in the microbiology lab when something like meningitis is suspected. Joint fluids, bronchial washings also can uh, be direct smeared with a gram stain and can give valuable information. Bronchial washings come from the lungs. It's not sputum coming from uh, the lungs and passing through the mouth. So it's a sterile fluid. Urine, when it comes from a catheter, also can be gram stained, although it rarely is done. If the specimen is from an otherwise sterile site but it has to pass through a non-sterile site, Finding certain types of bacteria can be significant. For example, sputum. Sputum, uh, when it's typically collected, it comes from the lungs, but it does have to pass through the oral cavity. Well, we could find a lot of streptococcus in there, and streptococci might be streptococcus pyogenes causing strep throat, or it might be streptococcus salivarius that's normally found in the um, mouth, so we don't know if it's a pathogen or not. However, if we do find gram-positive diplococci that are shaped like lancets, this is uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. And streptococcus pneumoniae is a cause of pneumonia, especially in the elderly. So there may be some value in doing a gram stain on a sputum. If the specimen is from a non-sterile site, direct smears are rarely performed because there is little value to the clinician. For example, stool. Stool contains so many organisms, it's not possible to find the needle in the haystack to differentiate pathogens from non-pathogens. The same with wounds. Wounds, uh, we're going to find, for example, Staphylococcus. I don't know if that's Staphylococcus aureus or Staphylococcus epidermidis because in the gram stain, they look the same. The acid fast stain is going to determine the presence or absence of mycolic acids which are certain types of lipids that are found in the cell wall. There are only two genera of bacteria that have these li lipids and are acid fast, mycobacterium and nocardia. Two versions of the procedure are available. 
The one we'll be doing is called the Zeal Nielsen stain. It uses heat to disrupt lipids and allows the nonpolar dye, that is called carbofuchsin, to enter into the cell wall. The Kenyan stain is going to disrupt the lipids as well, but it's going to use detergent to do that. The nonpolar dye, carbofuchsin, then will enter the cell wall. The acid fast stain is done with a special slide. It's called an AFB check slide, and you can see on this slide that there is a control area. Pre-applied bacteria are there, and in the positive circle is Mycobacterium kansasii, and in the negative circle is Escherichia coli. In the other oval area, the test area, you'll be applying an organism known as Mycobacterium smegmatis in a drop of water. If you don't know uh, where Mycobacterium smegmatis resides, you want to look that up. We find this organism in smegma. You're going to apply the organism in a drop of water, but you'll notice that it doesn't emulsify very well. Mycobacterium smegmatis being a mycobacterium is going to have these mycolic acids in the cell wall which are quite waxy so it's going to chunk up a little bit in this drop of water. You can expect that. The procedure involves covering the smear with carbofuchsin. Now we're going to put a drop uh, or we're going to put a strip of filter paper on it in order to keep the slide from drying out. You're going to steam this over boiling water for 8 to 10 minutes and add additional stain if the stain boils off. You're then going to pick up the slide with your clothespin, not your fingers, and after it's cooled you're going to decolorize it with acid alcohol. Acid alcohol is alcohol with 3% hydrochloric acid. You're going to stop the decolorization by rinsing briefly with water and then counter stain with methylene blue for 30 seconds. Again you will rinse briefly and blot it dry with bibulous paper and examine directly under oil immersion. You'll also be performing the Schaefer Fulton endospore stain on a species of bacillus. Endospores have a permeability barrier that prevents dyes from entering unless the barrier is disrupted by heat. Again, you will make a smear. The smear is going to be air dried and heat fixed and then you are going to cover the smear with a piece of filter paper. Both the spores and the vegetative cells will stain with the primary dye during the steaming. The primary dye is malachite green. After the staining period or the steaming period, excuse me, of 10 minutes, you'll rinse with water and this will remove the green dye from the vegetative cells. The spores will retain this green color. You're then going to use a counter stain known as safranin that you've met before in the gram stain. Safranin will stain the vegetative cells red. Spore or no spore, any bacterium that can accept a basic dye will stain red in this procedure. You'll also be observing a prepared slide of the Leafland, Leafson flagella stain. Bacterial flagella are too thin to be observed with a light microscope in a conventional stain. This stain uses tannic acid and the dye pararosanolin. The two form a colloidal precipitate that when absorbed by the flagellum causes it to increase in diameter and become colorized, a reddish brown. It's sort of like hair product, that's a gel that sticks to the hair. And we can then see the arrangement of bacteria bacterial flagella. Now keep in mind that an organism, if it doesn't have flagella, will stain this reddish brown. You just will not see the flagella. There are a number of flagellar arrangements. If there is a single flagellum on one end, and typically we find flage flagella on rod-shaped bacteria, a single flagellum is known as monotrichus. Vibrio cholerae is a monotrichus vibrio shaped organism. A tuft of flagella is called a lophotrichus arrangement. The tuft may be at one end or at both. You could have a single flagellum at one or both ends. And when they are at both ends, we call this an amphitrichus arrangement. So Spirillum serpens, for example, is amphitrichus and lophotrichus. 
finally, when we see flagella all around the perimeter of the bacterium, we call this peritrichus. Peritrichus flagella are found on Escherichia coli and also on Proteus vulgaris. The slide you see here is Proteus vulgaris with its lovely peritrichus flagella. In period two, you're going to observe all of the slides that you prepared using oil immersion. You're going to draw your observations on your lab report sheet using colored pencils for future reference. Your gram stain is going to be graded. You're going to focus on one of the two specimens using oil immersion and call me over to observe it. Escherichia coli will present as gram negative bacilli. Staphylococcus epidermidis will present as gram positive cocci. Don't worry, if it doesn't work for you, you can always stain your other slide or you can during the next lab period stain another sample of Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis. You'll be given multiple opportunities to get this right. The acid fast stain and the positive control area you will see fuchsia stained Mycobacterium kansasii. Escherichia coli in the negative control circle is going to stain blue because Escherichia coli is acid fast negative. In the test oval you have Mycobacterium smegmatis, and these will stain as fuchsia bacilli. Very often they are quite clumped together. Remember they are hydrophobic uh, due to the waxes that are in the cell wall, the mycolic acids, and so they don't spread out very nicely. If you are able to get them spread out, they often look like tree branches that have fallen down after a storm. In the Schaefer Fulton spore stain, you are going to see teal spores and vegetative cells being red. Now hopefully you'll be lucky enough that you'll see some teal spores actually within the bacterial cells themselves. The only two clinically important bacteria, remember, that form endospores are Clostridium and Bacillus. In this lab, you are staining a Bacillus species. The location of the spore can be important in identification. The Lifeson flagella stain is going to show two different organisms. The first one is Spirillum volutans. How would you describe the flagellar arrangement for this organism? Note that you are observing Spirillum volutans at 400x. This is a very large organism, very commonly found in sewage, and it is so large that you don't need oil immersion to see it. The second organism you will be observing is Proteus vulgaris. You will observe this with oil immersion. What is the flagellar arrangement of this organism? See you in lab.